Welcome to Progressivism Part 2. In the second half of Lecture 20, we're going to explore three progressive presidents and their effect on American politics. Our first progressive president is not unlike Mighty Thor. Meet Mighty T. Roosevelt, who will wield his progressive hammer in order to dramatically reshape the American presidency in the 20th century. Roosevelt's first contribution to the progressive movement as a president was to use the Sherman Antitrust Act for its original intended purpose, that is, to regulate monopolies. Starting in 1902, President Roosevelt began the use of this antitrust law against a railroad monopoly. Roosevelt argued from the position of regulating monopolies because they hurt the public. This is called the rule of reason. Industrial giants themselves are not wrong or necessarily bad. But when monopolies harm the US public, they deserve to be regulated. So Roosevelt does not actually advocate breaking up all monopolies, but only those that are harmful to the United States. And eventually he will take down 44 monopolies. Roosevelt also intervenes in a coal strike in 1902 in a way that actually helps the striking workers. This is a dramatic departure from his predecessors who very frequently took the side of business when there were conflicts between workers and businesses. In 1906, Roosevelt signed the Pure Food and Drug Act to label medicines so that their ingredients would be clear to consumers and consumers could safely trust that the products they were taking weren't gonna kill them. Same year, Roosevelt signs the Meat Inspection Act which tackled the issue of food safety by requiring regular inspections of meat processing plants. And Roosevelt is also noted for his conservation efforts. Roosevelt believed in saving lands for future use. That is, the land could be used in the future and needed to be preserved for that use in the future. We shouldn't waste resources in the here and now. That was a different position than preservationists. People like John Muir argued that land should be set aside and not for their utility or usefulness. They should be preserved for their beauty, for their natural um, sort of contribution to the beauty of the world, and we shouldn't see them as something that should be saved just because some business might need to use it at some point down the road. As a very colorful figure, Teddy Roosevelt was associated very strongly with trust busting. And cartoons of the day pictured him wielding his big stick in order to take down trusts. Because Roosevelt was a noted big game hunter, one cartoonist, portrayed him as shooting the bad trusts. So the little bear laying at his feet is a, a trust that is harmful or, or terrible for the United States as a whole. But also he has tied up a good trust. So this cartoon very clearly illustrates Roosevelt's rule of reason, the idea that not every trust was necessarily bad for the United States that in fact, a trust that behaved well could be allowed to continue in business. In the other cartoon, of course, um, Teddy Roosevelt is not molly coddling the trusts. He's taken a swing and he is taking down everything. Many of the companies, of course, needed some regulation because in the 19th century, you could pretty much throw anything into a bottle um, and sell it as a cure for whatever you wanted to sell it as a cure for. And we would, of course, be taking our lives into our own hands if we traveled into the 19th century and took any of these medications. One-night cough syrup, 
um, contain alcohol, obviously, of course, you're going to sleep because you'll be drunk. Cannabis was in many of the drugs of the time period. Chloroform, um, morphine, sulfur. All of these um, chemicals that were in many of the drugs of the time period didn't really cure the illnesses, or they provided such a strong uh, cure that they could be addictive, as in the cocaine toothache drops advertised with these wonderful kids on the front. Little Junior is teething, his teeth hurt. Cocaine is the answer. But not only did Americans want greater regulation of their drug supply and products to know what was in them and to know that they're safe, they also wanted to know that their foods were safe. As we talked about in the first half of the lecture, many progressive women went on campaigns against purveyors of dirty and dangerous food because who knows what was in your meat, in your milk, in your butter, in your sugar. Here, Teddy Roosevelt is using the muckrake uh, to dig up uh, an investigation on what is in the meat that Americans are eating. Americans not only complained about the safety of their food in terms of its um, composition and danger to folks, they complained about prices. So we have a cartoon here where the Beef Trust is charging high prices for products that are adulterated and gross and not good for you. A popular cartoon of the time period went, Mary had a little lamb and when she saw it sicken, she shipped it off to Packingtown and now it's labeled chicken. In Upton Sinclair's jungle, passages such as this one led Americans to collectively throw up at the thought of what they were putting into their bodies. As for the other men who worked in the tank rooms in which there were open vats near the floor, their peculiar trouble was that they fell into the vats and when they were fished out, there was never enough of them left to be worth exhibiting. Sometimes they would be overlooked for days till all but the bones of them had gone out into the world as Durham's pure leaf lard. A humorist of the day mocked the whole situation by creating a story involving Teddy Roosevelt. Um, you'll notice the use of dialect here. Teddy was reading Upton Sinclair's novel, torn with a light breakfast, and idly turning over the pages of the new book with both hands. Suddenly he rose from the table and cried, I'm pies, and began throwing sausages out of the window. The knife one shrunk center beverage on the head and made him a blonde. It bounced off, exploded, and blew the leg off a secret service agent and the scattered fragments destroyed a handsome row of old oak trees. Senator Beveridge rushed in thinking that the president was being assassinated by his devoted followers in the Senate and discovered Teddy engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat with a potted ham. The senator from Indiana, with a few director words, put out the fuse and rendered the missile harmless. Since then, the president, like the rest of us, has become a vegetarian. Teddy was also a devoted outdoorsman, and we've mentioned his love for nature, his love for big game hunting, for camping, um, led him to uh, support the conservation of America's resources. But note that it's conservation for the purposes of being able to use them. Teddy does not necessarily believe in holding lands aside and never touching them. They could be used, they could be enjoyed, they just need to be managed uh, for the future. He's pictured in the second picture with John Muir, the noted naturalist who supported preservation of America's wild places and spaces in order to keep their natural beauty from the harmful reach of humankind. Now on to our second progressive president, 
William Taft Smash. Arr. Taft, for all his hulk and heft, was actually not a popular president politically. He was not charming as sort of Roosevelt was. He lacked the stage presence um, that Roosevelt could muster up uh, with his bully pulpit and his ability to charm audiences with his progressive thoughts that seemed down home and manly all at the same time. Um, still, Taft, as a lawyer, who would go on to be Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, busted more trusts he, than Roosevelt did. In fact, Roosevelt thought Taft was overzealous in trust busting. So after four years of a lackluster presidency, in the election of 1912, Roosevelt would challenge Taft for the leadership of the country. Teddy tried to come back as a progressive Republican candidate, but the Republican Party said, no thanks. And his platform of new nationalism was rejected in favor of a more conservative Republican platform. So Teddy, being Teddy Roosevelt, formed his own new political party. The progressives, nicknamed the Bull Moose Party, uh, Roosevelt said that he was as strong as a bull moose, and after being um, shot while campaigning, um, he certainly could claim that he did have the strength and the vigor to lead the country. The election split the Republican Party, and unfortunately for them, threw the vote over to a Democrat. There were, I should mention, three other candidates two flavors of socialists for president, and one prohibition party candidate. So Taft not only has a pretty lackluster presidency, his um, ultimate sort of contribution is to split the Republicans with Teddy Roosevelt and then pave the way for a Democrat. It's the first Democrat in office since the 1890s, Grover Cleveland. for his weight. He was um, quite a hulking president, um, struggled with, of course, dieting uh, most of his life, frequently fell asleep after dinner at parties uh, just from the sheer exhaustion. He um, is shown pictured here as the governor of the Philippines riding a water buffalo, as one does. Here is Taft's famous bathtub, a very large um, as you can tell from the picture. The story goes that he got stuck in it, but we don't actually have any evidence that he did get stuck in his bathtub, this uh, sort of personal jacuzzi for one. In the election of 1912, the top three candidates are essentially two flavors of Republican and then a Democrat, uh, which splits the Republican vote, throws the vote over to the Democrats, um, the platforms of the, the candidates are pretty similar, though you'll note some minor differences. The Republicans um, and Teddy Roosevelt have the most similarity in their platforms, though Roosevelt clearly has the more progressive, forward-looking platform. Wilson, we'll see, is a little bit vague. Taft, protect the tariff restrained monopolies, whatever that means, conservation of resources, prohibition of campaign contributions by big business, which is, of course, a big fight of our own time, thanks to the Supreme Court decision of Citizens United. Teddy Roosevelt's new nationalism, regulation of trusts in his way, not the Taft way, minimum wage, workmen's compensation, no child labor, income tax, women's suffrage, so look at how much more specific this platform is, how much more progressive it is. Woodrow Wilson, new freedom, sort of vaguely attacking the triple wall of privilege, calling for reform of banks, tariffs, and trusts. Oh my. And as we know, Wilson wins it. Professor Wilson, shown here in this cartoon, um, doing the finishing touches to Teddy Roosevelt's Bull Moose, 
as you can tell, is a educated man. He wears the mortar board, signifying college graduate. That's because he is a PhD. So America's most uh, educated president to this point. And his background includes being uh, president of Princeton, where he taught, as well as being governor of New Jersey. So I liken him to the Iron Man. He's a bit of a jerk um, because he thinks he knows it all. And he thinks, of course, he's better than everybody else. And he's pretty smart. As president, Professor Wilson was able to sign many pieces of progressive legislation into law that fulfilled his promise of regulating the banks and Wall Street and the money supply. And one of the most important is in fact about the money supply. It's the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. In signing this bill into law, Wilson was able to make good on a problem that the populists had raised, namely the lack of a circulating medium. Whereas the populists had called for free coinage of silver, the Federal Reserve Act created a system of banks to regulate the nation's money supply and to make sure that there would be an adequate circulating medium at all times. The Clayton Antitrust Act in 1914 allowed the United States to regulate trusts more effectively and specifically declared that unions were not trusts. The Federal Trade Commission Act helped to also continue the spirit of progressive regulation by investigating companies in order to persecute monopolies or prosecute monopolies. I guess the monopolies felt persecuted too. The goal of this is really to prevent monopolies. So the investigatory powers the FTC has are really designed to prevent problems rather than simply break up a monopoly when it becomes a problem. Wilson uh, also gets to take advantage of the income tax, the 16th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which would make good of once again on a populist demand for taxing the wealthy um, who were able to live quite large off the resources of the United States. This income tax did not apply to ordinary Americans. It only applied to uh, the richest uh, income earners in the United States. Wilson signed labor legislation. The Keating Owen Labor Act would ban child labor. He supported an eight hour workday for railway workers. And uh, there was a workman's comp law passed for federal workers. So pretty progressive uh, pro-labor positions, as you can see from these three examples. Uh, I would like to point out that there are some limits here. Notice uh, the comp law passed for federal workers would only apply to federal workers. It wouldn't force private companies to have a workman's comp law. So if you're hurt working for Rock Rockefeller, sorry, no workman's comp for you. And note too, the abolition of child labor, the Keating Owen Act, is actually struck down by the US Supreme Court. So no matter the progressive thrust of Wilsonian policies, there are forces that are still pushing back against the progressive plan of improving the health, safety, and overall lives of workers. Uh, overall, though, Professor Wilson is able to sign into law several pieces of legislation to attack that triple wall of privilege that um, he opposed. But as we're going to see in the next lecture, a lot of his attention will be overshadowed um, and uh, overtaken by World War I. Um, and he will end his presidency, his second term in office, uh, weighed down by the cares of that war. Wilson was portrayed in much the same way as Roosevelt um, was in attacking, uh, you know, illicit business. 
And uh, this cartoon suggests here he's the new sheriff in town. Um, he's going to go after flim flam finance, tariff graft, crooked uh, businessmen, those who would adulterate food. Um, notice he's the lawman, though. This cartoon does not portray him as, you know, having taken up the progressive big stick of Roosevelt. So it's a little bit more subdued. Unlike this cartoon, which shows Wilson climbing into the White House attic and discovering Teddy Roosevelt's big stick laying in cobwebs among the treasures of the attic. And he is about to pick it up and use it on behalf of those who need it most in America. So that's been our look at three progressive presidents, progressive in different ways, but all taking part in that 20th century move to improve public health, increase democracy, tackle the problem of the wealthy um, and their control of American politics, um, as well as um, to more effectively regulate the business affairs of the United States, um, to make sure that the U.S. is functioning efficiently um, and effectively for the betterment of most, not necessarily all. Historians have uh, left mixed reviews about the progressive legacies of these guys. They're certainly not the most progressive, the most forward-looking voices, but they do represent the general um, thrust of their times, namely to push back against the laissez-faire capitalism of the Gilded Age, to push back against the robber barons' domination of American economic and public life. That's been our look at the progressive presidents. Join me next time for our World War I adventure.